American presidents have long been criticized for being too enthralled to the Jewish lobby. The American Jews influence U.S. foreign policy, and that explains Washington's unwavering support for Israel. So what happens if American Jews fall out of love with Israel? That's what the Jewish-American academic Norman Finkelstein claims is happening. But then he's nothing if not controversial. He, after all, is famous for accusing Jews of exploiting the Holocaust. And his actions have so incensed Israel, it's banned him from entering the country. Could he be right? And if he is, what does that mean for Middle East policy? Norman Finkelstein, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you so much for having me. Um, what is the evidence that American Jews are falling out of love with Israel? Well, there are two kinds of evidence. There's the survey evidence, the polling evidence. Jews are heavily polled. And the evidence shows that American Jews are the technical term that's used is American Jews are distancing themselves from Israel. And that's particularly true of the younger generations, under 40, under 35. There is serious concern in the Jewish community because of the distancing of American Jews, in particular the youth from Israel. And then there's what you might call the anecdotal evidence. For example, the uh, current editor of the influential New Yorker magazine in the United States, David Remnick, he has in recent months, in the last year, been expressing strong disapproval of Israeli policies. There's the former editor of the senior editor of the New Republic, uh, Peter Beinart, who, who just came out with a book called The Crisis of Zionism. And there are just a large number of public testimonials by Jews, again, mostly in the younger generation, you would say the 40s cohort and younger, who are expressing extreme uh, dismay to the point of, uh, you might say, verging on disgust with the way Israel is carrying on. But given Israel's troubled history, you're arguing that there's something more significant going on than has previously gone on, because there, goodness knows there's been a sort of, there's a waxing and waning in any relationship, and that's happened throughout American Israel's uh, uh, relationship and history. Yeah, there is a waxing and a waning, there's no question about that, but there is something significantly different in the last, say, 10 or 15 years, and that's American Jews know a lot more about what's happening in Israel in relationship in particular to the Palestinians but also internally. There was a time where you can call yourself liberal which is what most American Jews do. About 80 percent of American Jews voted for Barack Obama which was the highest percentage of any ethnic group in the United States except African Americans. American Jews are generally liberal and there was a time when American Jews could call themselves liberal and say they're pro-Israeli because Israel seemed like the only democracy in the Middle East that was practiced purity of arms in wartime. Uh, it was the light unto the nations. And many American Jews believe that. But in the last 10 or 15 years, there's just a lot more known, um, in particular, by the way, because of this, the research of Israeli historians, the research of Jewish historians, because of the revelations, the reports of human rights organizations, many of which are staffed by Jews, and the leadership is Jewish, and because of all of this information from authoritative places. Now, it's not, it, it, there was a time in the past where this information was known, but it was known by people who were pretty marginal. No, now, it's mainstream people who are saying this, and American Jews have a, a big problem saying they're both liberal and support the way Israel okay. carries on. But even if you were to accept the argument <coughs> that they know more, and it's quite a difficult argument to accept given that over decades, uh, you know, an awful lot there has been a close relationship so people know, but even if you were to accept that argument, mm -hmm. you look at some surveys, and Brandeis University did a survey where they questioned 1,200 and predominantly young Jewish Americans, mm -hmm. uh, and they found that basically their conclusion was that Jewish attachment to Israel was unchanged over 24 Five years. Yeah, I'm familiar with that survey. Uh, you know, you can't, um, f uh, 
when you're dealing with um, evidence, there's a huge amount of evidence. You can't focus in on one pole or focus in on two poles. Uh, Jews are very heavily polled. There's a huge amount of survey evidence. So if you take, for example, the most recent authoritative poll that was done just about two months ago, they, were asked, they asked American Jews, what is most important to your Jewish identity? And about half of American Jews said what's most important to their Jewish identity is working for social equality, liberal causes. Only around 20% said Israel was important to their Jewish identity. It and was yet, a very I'm surprising finding. In the finding. survey that I'm quoting, mm -hmm. when they asked these similar sort of questions, mm -hmm. they found that 75% agreed that caring about Israel was an important part mm -hmm. of Jewish identity. Mm -hmm. And what they found mm -hmm. was that, yes, in the young, there wasn't the closeness, mm -hmm. but that actually, as Jewish Americans got older, that attachment got stronger. Yeah, that's a usual argument. It's called the life cycle argument that when you're younger you feel more distance from Israel as you get older you return to your roots and you discover your heritage and you be feel closer to Israel but the evidence seems to show I don't want to be uh, I don't want to be polemical about this it's true what you say that the evidence is there is some evidence on the other side and that's why I added when I said it's not just the survey evidence, it's not just the anecdotal, it's not just the survey evidence, but there's an awful lot of anecdotal evidence. Let me just give you a simple example. June 6, 1982 is when I first got involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict. It's literally 30 years ago next month. It's a, a three-decade anniversary. And when I first got involved in the conflict, when you went on college campuses, a person like myself, it evoked complete pandemonium, it evoked complete hysteria. There would be pe shouting in the audiences and there would be the huge demonstrations outside and there would be distributing all of these defamatory leaflets about myself and so on and so forth. Now when I go to college campuses, uh, very few Jews even bother showing up. Because if you're young and you're Jewish and you're on a college campus, Right? You're idealistic. That's what most young Jews are. They're liberal, Jewish, idealistic. But you're, you're, you're on a college you're, campus. You're, you're putting forward this argument, which you seem to be suggesting, mm -hmm. suggests that they've all changed. The argument is, is you're not taken so seriously. No, I don't think it's correct to say I'm not taken so seriously. If I could just give you, you know, I'm not afraid of those sorts of arguments. If they were valid, I would certainly be open to them. But let's say just last week I spoke at the Jewish Society at Yale University. Tonight I'm speaking at the Oxford Union. Uh, I don't think it's accurate to say that I'm not being taken seriously. But you have I a think reputation. It's, I think you have a reputation for being difficult, and people well, discount you in a way that perhaps they wouldn't. Less, less polemical. You say you don't want to be polemical, <laughs> but less vitriolic uh, academics. Uh, there's a possibility of that, and one has to be open to those interpretations. But that wouldn't explain then how do you account for the fact that people like David Remnick, the current editor of the New Yorker magazine which basically services a largely Jewish audience. Or a uh, former senior editor of the New Republic, Peter, Peter Beinard. Now the New Republic was rabidly pro-Israel. Peter Beinard himself is an Orthodox but Jew. And they too are now speaking out in quite strong terms. I've read Peter Beinard's book, The Crisis okay. of Zionism. In quite strong terms have been critical of Israeli policy. Um, Why does it matter? You know, I mean, there is an argument that actually, so what? Well, the reason it matters is the nature of the uh, Israel lobby, it has two features to it. There's the hardcore, which is a lobby. They're paid agents of a foreign country, and their job is to try to sell the foreign country's policies to the United States, sort of like the Cuba lobby, there's the Israel lobby. But beyond the hardcore, the, what makes the lobby so powerful is the periphery of large numbers of Jews in influential places, in magazines, in newspapers, on television, in film, a large uh, periphery of Jews who also have deeply felt, heartfelt feelings for Israel. And that, and that periphery is now being lost. 
American Jews just and don't... And so what? And what your argument is that you're left with is hardcore, that you say right. being paid what? By the Israeli well, government based, to get their way with Washington? They're a lobby. That's their job. But are you saying they're right. paid by the Israeli government I to get say, their way in Washington? I, I would say that's what a lobby does. A Cuba lobby lobbies for Cuba. An Ireland uh, lobby are lobbies for Ireland. And this lobby lobbies... And this yeah, lobby... But they're, the not, Israel... but they're not... You, AIPAC would I say they are I'm, not paid I'm, by the Israeli, no, I don't, Israeli I don't, government. I don't, that's the nature of how American society works. You have lobbies. Are you lobbies. saying that they're paid by Israel? I just want to... Um, be... You know, actually, I'll tell you the truth. I don't even know how they're paid. And it's not particularly important. I don't... As an American, that's the way it our system works. No, that's, that's the, the way our system... That's one of the, thing that, one of the that's things what, that That's the way to... our system works. Our system works through lobbies. And there are and lobbies... And it is very important. And because you lobbies. make certain claims you, and, and you, you enrage read, people. And, you, they, and they wonder then whether they should listen to the next you, thing that if you, you say. If you read their statements, they freely say... We work for Israel. Israel is our cause. And as an American, you're allowed to do that. That's the nature of our okay. system. So let's go, though, to what you're suggesting is happening as mm -hmm. a result. That actually, mm -hmm. you seem to be suggesting that the, those who are, would be interested are no longer caring. And you're left mm -hmm. with this hardcore mm -hmm. of passionate people who, from, from what you're suggesting, are basically doing the Israeli government's bidding in Washington. Right, and I think that they will have less sway, less sway, less power, if the periphery begins to distance itself from Israel. But if and the periphery don't care, then a, the American president isn't going to care. If the periphery doesn't care, well, there is an issue there. There's a question of whether people are going to fall silent, because Jews, like other ethnic groups, they do believe it's not good to air your dirty laundry in public, or whether you can actually reach these Jews and try to get them to support a just and reasonable settlement of the conflict. There is personally, another thing, which is, that you're, I mean, because we're talking about Israel mm -hmm. here, a, a country that is democratic, that decides who it's on its government through mm -hmm. elections, mm -hmm. and really it's down to the Israeli people to elect whom they want to run mm -hmm. their government, and, and if they want, they can kick them out. Right, but the problem is it's not because of the Israeli people, it's because of the American veto and because of American power that Israel gets to carry on the way it does. Were it not for the American veto and were it not for the fact that the United States blocks any kind of international action when it comes to Israel. So those the things that you would, would been, criticize about Israel, so like for example settlements, you're saying is it President Obama's fault? Well, is it President Obama's fault? I would say in the case of the Israel lobby, in the case of the Israel-Palestine conflict, I do think it's basically the lobby. If you were to ask me if tomorrow Pre uh, Benjamin Netanyahu were to announce we're no longer building settlements in the occupied territories, where he'd make that announcement. And he made the announcement of a freeze. Would, would, yeah, a freeze. Yeah. If you were to make that, would Obama be unhappy? Of course he would be happy. He would be thrilled at that exactly. announcement. Exactly. So, so if Obama goes along with it when they build settlements, it must be because of the lobby. That's just common sense. So your argument is that despite Obama saying from the word go and being absolutely mm -hmm. clear that Israel should stop all settlement Well, he growth, hasn't done that. But he has ever no, since. No, he's consistently backed down. Every time the lobby has gone into action, he's consistently backed down. What he, he, he has made clear so publicly mm -hmm. the American position. That's exactly what you're saying is exactly correct. He's repeatedly stated that he doesn't support the actions, and then the pressure is applied by the lobby, and he's repeatedly backed down. Backed obviously, down from what, well, what are you saying the he's backed down? Are you saying him privately the, right, to, to the, the Israeli Prime Minister? He's saying it's all right. Look, obviously the President of the United States has the power to tell Israel you're going to have to stop building settlements in the occupied territories, because if you don't stop, we're just not going to exercise our veto in the Security Council. He can tell them that, obviously. He's the President of the United States. If he doesn't tell them that, it must be because of the lobby. Okay. So, if what you're saying is true, mm -hmm. and we then have a, a diaspora that doesn't care so much about Israel, how's that going to change things, are you suggesting? Well, it depends. Uh, if that diaspora gets behind a, a reasonable settlement of the conflict, and obviously a reasonable settlement of the conflict would have to include not just the freezing of settlements, but the dismantlement of the settlements. If they get behind that, 
that would put new kinds of pressure on the president in the opposite direction, and that would be a positive development. Now, that's a big if. I agree with you. I'll anticipate your question. It's a big if because most American Jews, like most ethnic groups, they prefer not to air the dirty laundry in public. But if you can win them over to a reasonable settlement of the conflict, I think it would actually uh, improve significantly the prospects for achieving a just and lasting settlement. If you say they don't care. Mm -hmm. And no, the argument I, mm -hmm. seems to be that actually, if they didn't care, mm -hmm. it might be better. And yet you're trying to win them over. Well, I'm saying there are, two, there are three possibilities. Number one, as up till now, they have been very forceful defenders of the state of Israel. And that's basically been a disaster, not only for the Palestinians, it's basically been a disaster for Israel as well, because they're supporting the most militarized policies of Israel, the most intransigent policies of Israel, and that's not been good. Obviously, it's been terrible for the Palestinians, it's been a nightmare, but it's not been good for Israel either. The second possibility is they're going to distance themselves from Israel but fall silent, because they don't want to air the dirty laundry in public. The third possibility is they will become vocal critics of Israeli policy and they will become a pressure group in the other and direction. Is, and this is your dream scenario. I mean, you've got a problem, yeah. though, because here you are saying this and you have a history. Mm -hmm. You have a history where, I mean, you, ever since you wrote about the Holocaust, the Holocaust industry, you, mm -hmm. you said that... Uh, there's a fixation on the Holocaust that has exacerbated insecurity of American Jews, causing group paranoia. It's a lucrative and tendentious industry that, that propagandizes uh, and, the, and it seems that lurking in the heart of even the gentlest of Gentiles is a homicidal anti-Semite. And so even where Jews feel safe, they still fe face imminent danger. Now you have faced huge amount of criticism for what you've said in that book. Uh, you were labeled a Holocaust denier. I mean, mm -hmm. your, your, your own parents who were in the Warsaw Ghetto or in concentration camps. Um, you went too far in a sense, and you consistently go too far. And people say that as a result, mm -hmm. your style has meant that you are, it's self-defeating. Your argument mm -hmm. isn't hurt. Well, actually, I think it's just the reverse. Most of what I said in the Holocaust industry, which came out already 10 years ago, it's not even considered controversial anymore. Quite the contrary, the one who's gone too far is the Israelis, it's Mr. Netanyahu. Uh, this, this past couple of weeks you saw it in the news. He kept talking about Auschwitz, kept talking about Auschwitz, kept talking about Auschwitz. Finally, even the Israelis said, Mr. Netanyahu, stop sure. talking about but Auschwitz. When you made the even Eli Wiesel said, Mr. Netanyahu, don't compare Iran to Auschwitz. But even when so you they've made gone the too far, not me. Years ago, there were people who mm -hmm. said, actually, what you're saying isn't new, and there are plenty of people who make exactly that case, Peter Novick's book about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But there's something about the way they, and Peter, for example, Peter Novick, made the case that was more powerful because they had an understanding, a sensitivity that was absent in your book and that as a result your book came across as a rant. And that's the suggestion about a lot of the arguments that you make. And that as a result we have the likes of Jonathan Friedland accusing you of doing the anti-Semites work for them and because you see Jews as either villains or victims he says, I fear that takes him closer to the people who created the Holocaust than to those who suffered in it. Well, Mr. Friedland is, of course, entitled to his judgment, but then we can, also call, we can also quote the judgment of the world's leading authority in the Nazi Holocaust by a wide margin, and that's Raoul Hilberg, the author of the classic uh, the, Extermina the, the, this, uh, the Destruction of the European Jews, the three-volume work. Now, Raoul Hilberg, he praised my book. He actually called it, since he said I go too far, he called, I'm quoting him now, he said my findings were conservative. He said he went through the same record as I did, and in fact, I understate the case in my book. So between Jonathan Friedland, who's a modestly talented columnist, and Raoul Hilberg, who's the world's leading authority in the Nazi Holocaust, I think, the judgment, I think the judgment of Hilberg is you know, higher. It I should could be valued. quote so many other people to yeah, you who can. have been cr very critical and are known as experts in the Holocaust. No, I the wouldn't point say is nobody really, is in the same rank as Mr. Hilberg. But the point is that it's your style and that mm -hmm. your style ends up being self-defeating. Oh, uh, and the uh, argument, for example, that you feed the anti-Semites, do you ever have any qualms that actually you are doing 
that you could be doing their work for them. Yeah, there, there is a problem there. And one has to be honest about those things. There is a problem uh, that you can end up uh, being uh, useful to people who you don't particularly like. Everybody has those sorts of problems when they're trying to deal with controversial subjects that you don't want to give fodder to your enemy. And then you have to make you know, decisions, you have to think through what you're saying, and you have to carry on responsibly. Do you and ever this hold is, back? Excuse me? Do you ever hold back? Do you ever self-censor? Yeah, I'm, you know, the Holocaust industry is now an old book for me, as I said, it's no, 10 I years ago. But, but when I wrote the book, I can say to you metaphorically, my parents had already passed away, but metaphorically, my parents were right behind me. They were looking at me over my shoulders, and they were looking at every word. Okay, uh, but, uh, but I ask you, so you make the point that's 10 years ago, and I appreciate mm -hmm. that, but you know, it's only recently you said of Israel, it's a crazy country, it's like a junkie. Every few years they go to war, they need their fix, they're lunatics. Mm -hmm. American yeah. Jews don't want to defend that. Yeah, Israel is carrying on in a lunatic fashion. I would like to ask you... you and Hezbollah, you, you, who you, you went to meet? I, I would like to ask you, name me another country in the world. 2003, Israel was the cheerleaders for the war in Iraq. 2006, it went into war in Lebanon. 2008, 2009, it attacked Gaza. Now it talks about attacking Iran. If, yeah, you read you the, if you read the Israeli papers every day, they talk about, should we attack Gaza? Should we attack Lebanon? Should we attack Syria? Name me, one other, name me another country in the world that falls you, into that category. Well, there are, That's a Is lunatic state. Israel would point to a number mm. of its neighbors you know, and say exactly no, the same no, thing. No, you show me how and many countries... How Can many I, countries has Iran planned to attack? It, no, let's it, ask a simple question. How many countries in the last 10 years has Iran attacked? Ask, when you look... No, that's a fair question. When you, how many countries in the last 10 years has Iran attacked? When you look at the history attacked? of Israel, mm -hmm. do you not have some sympathy or understanding, mm -hmm. people would ask, as to why they feel threatened and well, why they consider... We're not talking about consider. why they feel threatened. We're talking about a country that every two or three years goes to war. And if you follow the press as I do, Every day they talk about, let's attack this country, let's attack that country. That's not normal. So, and when, you, when and I call the so lunatic state... So why is it that the Israeli mm -hmm. people vote in this government that you say is responsible well, for that? I, I think it's a regrettable fact. I don't say these things with glee. I'm not happy about that fact. As the American economist, the Nobel laureate Paul Krugman, put it in the New York Times last week, he said it's perfectly obvious Israel's headed towards national suicide. It's become a crazy state. And he says it's not good for Jews, it's not good for the world where Israel is headed. And yet it's, I have still, repeatedly seen, said, it's still seen, I've of course, as the said, safe haven, mm -hmm. the homeland for the Jews. Well, you have a right to live there, although you're banned. <laughs> Would you, would you I go think back? that's a contradiction in terms, but we'll leave that aside. I know, but uh, you, you I, could I, test I, it. Would yeah. you go there? Would I go to Israel? I think there's a misunderstanding here. I don't have any particularly hostile fe feelings towards Israel, nor feelings of love towards the state of Israel. It's just not my thing. My thing is, I want to achieve a just and lasting peace for the Palestinians How? and for the Israelis. It's very hard to reconcile that statement about mm -hmm. your lack of feelings towards mm -hmm. the country with I'm, the fact that it's the center of your work for well, decades. Because, well, it's sort of like you have strong feelings about the media. That's your work. And for the past 30 years, that's where I've devoted my energies. And the question and so of, of identity. I, have I ask you about whether you would go back, go there. Well, I can't go back. America is my home. And you, you, I don't, I don't, you, I don't, you made I every year not, you used to I go to Israel. Born, no, every do you year feel I used any to connection go, to it as a Jew? As a, no, as a, I, uh, I don't want to put on false pretenses. I'm not going to start you know, uh, beating my breast. No, I'm an American. I was born in the United States. My parents were from Eastern Europe. There's no connection with Israel. I have some American friends who emigrated to Israel, and I remain in touch with them. We remain friends. But beyond that, I have no more special connection with Israel than I have with any other part of the world. And Norman I'm not going Finkelstein. to pretend otherwise. Thank you for coming on Hard Talk. Sure, my pleasure.